Hello and welcome to 5x15 online. My name is Eleanor O'Keefe and whether you're joining us live or listening to us on catch up, I'm really delighted to be welcoming you to what promises to be a thrillingly thoughtful and stimulating conversation between Claudia Rankin and Emma DeBerry. Claudia Rankin is one of America's most highly respected, original and influential writers. She's joining us to discuss her internationally acclaimed new collection of poetry and essays. It's entitled Just Us, an American Conversation. It's the third volume in her groundbreaking American Lyric Trilogy, and it's just come out in paperback. The other volumes of the trilogy include Don't Let Me Be Lonely and Citizen, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's a, a MacArthur Fellow and a former Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Claudia also teaches at NYU. Interviewing her this evening, we have Emma Dabiri. Emma is the author of two best-selling and groundbreaking books, What White People Can Do Next, From Allyship to Coalition, and Don't Touch My Hair. Emma is an academic, an activist, a broadcaster, and she's in the final year of her PhD in visual sociology at Goldsmiths. As ever, books can be purchased from our independent book partner, Newham Books, and details are in the chat. Um, we would be absolutely thrilled if you put your questions in the Q&A box, and Emma will come to those at the end of their chat. Um, with no further ado, I think I had better hand over to Emma. Emma and Claudia, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. Good evening. So I'm greatly looking forward to this conversation. Um, to start us off, I just want to um, ask you, Claudia, about um, the, the physicality actually of the book itself. It's obviously a book, but really operates as a, a piece of, you know, visual culture or even a work of art itself. It's a really beautiful book, I think, you know, visually and aesthetically. And the design features, some of the design features in it are also um, really interesting. What I particularly loved was how, as an academic, you incorporate referencing and facts checking into and your notes and sources into the design so rather than that being something that you have to kind of you know shy away from writing a non-academic book it's actually something that you kind of foreground in a way but present in this really beautiful and innovative way could you tell us a little bit more about the process behind the design and um yeah some of the thinking that went into that well emma it's, it's a real honor to share this virtual space with you. I, I'm a great fan. Um, I, uh, I feel a student of your work. And so it, it's an honor to be here. The, um, the design of the book, um, it, it's a great place to start actually, because I, I, I thought a lot about it. <laughs> it's a book that was less interested in the communication of information um, through the words, but also through, but more interested in the communication through form. And so I, we're in a moment where, as you write about, um, people rely on um, public media, um, Wikipedia to get their information, Facebook, etc., and. And so we've lost the kind of um, rigor of, of fact-checking and the, the, the ease in which alternative facts and alternative history fall into <laughs> the culture and become real is frightening and has frightening ramifications. And so I wanted to put together a book that fact-checked itself and fact-checked itself not only in terms of looking at the academic sources, but also psychologically. So I hired a, a, um, 
a psychiatrist. And we went through all of the essays together. And I, I would ask her, why do you think I said that? Why do you think I did that? Why do you think I was upset about this or that thing? And we discussed it and I tried to um, fold some of what I learned into the rewrite of the essay. And then I hired a fact checker, an actual fact checker. And he and I went through all of the essays and, um, and brought in legal documentation as well um, of other things. And then I brought in a lot of the, um, you know, my, my stuff that I wanted in. And we had a lawyer look at the text. And then I had the, the, the challenge of creating a page where all of that became apparent. And so th that's why um, the recto page and the verso page are in conversation with each other. The little red dot points you to moments in the text where my memory of something might be a little bit off. The real fact is this, my memory of it and how I would have said it in the conversation with you is this. And it was important that the conversations actually um, represent what actually happened because the final stage was to take the essay and give it back to the person I had the conversation with and say to them, is this the conversation we had? Is this what you remember? And do you think it act, you know, more or less represents exactly what happened? And no one ever said, no, this is not the conversation we had. What people said were, no, this is the conversation we had. This is what I said, this is what you said, but it's not necessarily what I meant. And when they said that, I said, well, will you write down what you meant? And we can add that in as the final step of the essay. Yeah, that's 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 so incredible. Um, what a what a process. I've never I've never heard I've never heard anything quite like that. I absolutely ad adored ad adore that that answer and that rationale. I think there's there's a there's a part of the book where that happens, um, where it's you go to see a play um, with a white friends and there's an instruction given to white members of the audience and your friend doesn't follow the instruction and then the book follows your internal analysis of what that means and how that how that how that affects you and you then present this information to your friend and she responds in writing, and then you include her response in the book. And the difference between your, your interpretation of it and her, your interpretation of why she didn't move, and then her rationale or justification for why she didn't move is so fascinating to watch unfold and it makes one think what would have happened if you hadn't had that exchange if you hadn't challenged her or asked her to further explain and she, or if, if you had but she had decided not to write back in response and including that whole exchange in the book to me was just one of the most um you know kind of powerful uh, things I've, I've read it's just yeah it, it's just such an innovative innovative way of writing and it's so so you know kind of collective and so moves so far away from the writer just as you know your individual subjectivity and interpretation being um you know kind of being sacrosanct um, so I think we've moved slightly on from what I wanted to what I wanted to ask you, but it was just what you said made, made me think of that other point in the book. To return more specifically to the design of the book, um, could I ask you to read a little excerpt um, about um, design, more, or, or one that one that kind of illustrates some of that more clearly? Um, of course, I, I will read um, on page one seventy nine. The gloom is. Partly because that was, um, this piece was influenced by how the white cube became the space for um, galleries um, over time. And, and 
its relationship to Nazi Germany and Hitler and the, the move on from the salon style into the, the, the gallery style in the white spaces that we know today. The gloom is the off-white of white because white can't know what white knows. Where's the life in that? Where's the right in that? Where's the white in that? At the bone of bone white be, breeds the fear of being, the frustration of seeming unequal to white. White portraits on white walls signal ownership of all, even as white walls white in. And this is understandable, yes. Understandable because the culture claims white is owed everything. A wealth of inheritance a system ensures. In each generation, the equation holds and better than before and indifferent to now and enough and always and inevitably white. This is what it means to wear a color and believe its touch and embrace. Even without luck or chance of birth, the scaffolding has rungs and legacy and the myth of meritocracy fixed in white. That's how white holds itself together as the day, days hold so many white would not. White is living within brick and mortar, walling off all others' loss, exhaustion, aggrieved exposure, dispossess, despair. In daylight, white hardens its features. Eyes which hold all light harden. Jaws closing down on justice harden into a fury that will not call white to account even as for some its pledge is cut out from under. If people could just come clean about their lives, even as poverty exists inside white walls and just being white is what's working. Who implies white could disown its own? Even as white would strike its own structure, even as white won't out, won't strike its own structure, even as white won't oust its own system. All redress fuels nothing the second another can be thrown out. In daylight, white right to righteous rage doubles down on the supremacy of white in our way. And, you know, you write about um, skin privilege and psychological attachments as being tied together. And this piece like lives inside of that. Like, what does it mean to psychically buy into the myth of whiteness despite your own living conditions? Yes. You know, which is what we're seeing very blatantly in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, so first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for, for reading that. It's just an immense privilege to, um, to, to, to hear you read uh, your, your poetry when I'm in conversation with you, poetry that I've, I've, your poetry that I have read myself so many times to hear you reading it is a huge privilege. So thank you so much. Um, and yes, that is something that um, I think is, is, is really, has been really interesting. The last point you raised is one that's been very interesting to me in terms of a lot of the current, I guess, mainstream liberal anti-racist conversation. This idea that all of the emphasis um, when we're talking about racism and when we're thinking about race and whiteness is whiteness's anti-black functions, which are of course <laughs> something we have to focus on, but often to the almost complete disregard of the psychological investment 
that people racialize as white, the attachment that they have to their racial identity beyond simply the anti-black functions of that racial identity. Is that something, yeah, that we could expand, you could expand a little on? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, it's not white, it's not only white people who have psychological attachments to whiteness, you know? Yes, I, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's across the board because it be, has become um, culturally ex accepted um, erroneously so, that white equals things it doesn't actually equal. And, and so across, across um, racial groups, we are racialized groups, we have people invested in it. And that's why mm -hmm. it's no longer about getting diversifying and getting a black person in there. It depends on who the black person is. It depends on who the Asian person is. It depends yes. on who, 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 because the culture has formed itself and concretized itself around beliefs that are really about the advancement of white people. Mm -hmm. And could we speak a little bit, another thing I see very kind of, that is very dominant in this moment is again an almost fetishization of representation you know as though representation the first black person to um will it, it is kind of a panacea for all of for all of this so in relation to the point that you just made um, it's, it's not so much that we have to have, you know, a black person in the position or a, an Asian person or whoever, what, whatever racialized group. Um, could we speak a little bit to the, the, the limits of, of representational politics? I think we have, I think there are two things. I think that when people think about diversity, they're thinking that if you have all of the same people in a room, that their investments will line up. And so many things will not, if you have a room full of men, they're not gonna think about um, childcare. I mean, you know, this is a stereotype. It's not- Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm sure there are men who think about childcare, but, <laughs> but, but if you have women who have just had children and the men might've had children, but they didn't, you know, um, then, then you have a, a better representation. So if you have people of color in the room, you have other things being considered. So it's not that I don't think that at times um, it's useful to have a diversified pool of people um, in these discussions, but I just don't think you can take for granted mm -hmm. what a, a person's um, affiliations and um, um, beliefs in terms of many things um, are just based on their skin color or based on their group identity. I mean, we saw that very blatantly in the Supreme Court. We now, you know, one of the things that our former president did was put a woman in the Supreme Court who, who is in support of taking away women's rights to choose. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, it doesn't, it's not, people are, are hesitant to, to think about things in nuanced ways. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it, it has to be approached that way because you cannot believe that um, these big categories are just gonna line up. They don't just line up. And these people are chosen specifically um, in order to enact and perform certain things um, depending on who put that, puts them in place. So I'm not, I'm not um, against the di diversifying of spaces that have held the majority white representation, especially in positions of um, power. But I am interested in a more nuanced look 
at the people who are moving into these positions. Absolutely. I think it's something that, as well that is very apparent uh, with the current uh, British cabinet, um, where it's the most it's the most diverse it's ever been, but also in many ways the most um, if 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 what they want comes to pass, also the most draconian that we've had in 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 decades. You know, so exactly um, these things can be turned against their initial. Um, intent very easily. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think that speaks very strongly to the necessity of, well, the, the, the necessity of nuance and mm -hmm. us needing to have nuance in our demands, you know, because if our demands might be met, but they might just further our <laughs> oppression mm -hmm. or our exploitation, unless we've been mindful about really what it is we're demanding and kind of thought it through to its logical, logical conclusion. Exactly. And you talk about, you know, um, coalition building as a um, necessary um, redress to what we've had so far. And I think one of the things that that allows is the discussion of certain things across um, bodies, basically, <laughs> and allows a more, a more, um, I, I'm going to keep my word, I'm going to keep the word nuance, um, enactment in the, in the, the impl you know, implementation of laws and policies that affect a large number of people, like healthcare, for example, in this country. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. And um, actually, that was something that I that I really wanted to um, move on to discuss with you, actually, I wanted to ask you. Um, okay, before I get to that, sorry. And I will, I will come to it. But just before I do, um, I wanted to ask you how you felt the world and racial discourse in particular, had shifted between or indeed if it had shifted well, we, well I, I would say it has um from the publication of citizen to the publication of um just just us an american conversation and do different cultural moments demand different responses even if they're over um you know relatively short periods of times Yeah, I mean, the, the obvious answer to that is yes. Um, but I, you know, I, I think certain things have shifted. I agree with you. I'm not saying that. Oh, yeah, sorry, I did say they have. I was like, I'm not saying they have. And I'm like, I did blatantly just say they have. <laughs> but um, I, I think that the world that Citizen lives in uh, is a much more discussed world but I don't know how profoundly the structure has shifted. And I can't know yeah. that yet. Of course, of course. I can't know it yet. We, but we are seeing people move into positions. Um, and we, you know, so in the face of um, a need for the examination of policing in the United States, we also have somebody like Mitch McConnell who has lined the courts with conservative judges across, um, and you know, while the former president was doing what he was doing, you had the Senate doing what they were doing, which was mm -hmm. creating a court system that will keep certain things in place. We've had voter suppression laws. We've had, um, you know, what happened in Texas with anti-abortion laws. We've had, yeah. so, so <laughs> we have more discussion. We have more um, public discourse around what is wrong mm -hmm. and the need for justice than we had when I wrote Citizen. But how much systemic change I can count on, I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't mm -hmm. know yet. No, I, 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 I would absolutely agree. I feel that the, the, the primary shift in that period is just the level of, awareness. I guess, wit witness, 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what that means more substantively is anyone's guess at this at this stage. Yeah, at this juncture, we don't know. Yeah. Um, I think related to that and what I was referring to um, previously when I said I don't want to jump ahead, I wanted to to talk about the the concept of of white privilege and um, this something that I write about in what white people can do next, but borrowing from Barbara Fields, where she makes the argument that attacking white privilege will never bring about the necessary coalitions and that people who want to see real, you know, kind of enduring systemic change need to make the case that what is better for you know, change it. What is better for a lot of Black Americans is actually better for a lot of Americans. You know, more more generally. What would be your yeah? What are your your thoughts in relation to that? And I, I guess the reason that I'm asking about do different cultural moments require different responses or different ways of telling stories or writing is because I think about when I first when white privilege as a, as a term and a concept began to be mainstreamed, how actually excited I felt about this thing being named and how over the course of, it's not been mainstream for a decade, but let me say mainstream for maybe five years, I've started to question actually its utility um, in terms of does it bring about that kind of systemic, not to, not to say it doesn't exist, but as a story, as a narrative, will it will it bring about what needs to happen? Um, this, you know, that's an excellent question because I think um, the way that I often hear that question is not about white privilege so much, but it it sometimes comes in this way. Why did Black Lives Matter use the phrase Black Lives Matter instead of All Lives Matter? Yeah. And why is it necessary to point at Black Lives? Why is it necessary to point to white privilege? And the, the entire endeavor in this, not just this country, in, in the um, the building of white supremacy is the invisibility of white supremacy and the mm-hmm. invisibility of w- what privilege white privilege looks like. And so if people feel at this moment um, that it feels too divisive or it feels too easy, that's only because it feels uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And in order to get to the place where you can have coalition building, you mm-hmm. have to move through the places that feel uncomfortable, that seem like they're not going to go anywhere, but they, we haven't gone anywhere. It's been you know, like, where have we gone? Where are the alternative phrases that yeah, yeah. Provided, provided a way out of this? They don't exist. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. haven't existed. And now we have um, these phrases like Black Lives Matter or white privilege that actually call forward actual systemic practices in our, in our um, countries. And people are like, no, 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 it's too much. How are we gonna build coalition if you point a finger? Mm-hmm. It's not pointing fingers, it's making transparent what the entire system was there to make invisible. And now it's out. Now we can talk about what privilege looks like versus what it doesn't look like. Mm-hmm. We can talk about why Black Lives Matter, it was necessary rather than all lives matter. And we can move and build on top of that in the making of coalitions. Mm-hmm. But it's not this or this, it's this, then this. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I honestly believe anybody asking why it's not all lives matter and the focus being on black lives matter you know is not engaged in any way in a good faith 
argument and is simply attempting to disrail and obscure, you know? Um, and I, I think, again, because, oh, sorry, go on. But sometimes when they say, I, it's not, I, I don't think it's not that they're not involved in a, in a sincere or good faith argument, but it's, it's that they're involved in a no conflict argument. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way I've heard it is, if you want to build coalition, why then alienate the people you want to build coalition with? Mm -hmm. Why not give us All Lives Matter so that we can all be in on the same page? Mm -hmm. and, and the reason we cannot do that is because of white privilege and that all lives don't matter in the same way mm -hmm. and haven't been treated systemically and sy systematically in the same way. I, what, what are your thoughts on the, something that really I, I, it is pronounced in, in the book I just wrote and that I think about a lot is the, you know, in, invention of the racial categories and the reason that whiteness as a racial classification was invented in the first place. And I think once you have familiarity with that history, the idea of a white supremacy, a white superiority, a white supremacy being, you know, these racial categories are not just neutral, natural things that happen to, you know, exist in nature. They are socially engineered categories uh, created I mean, black and white, created in order to naturalize the concept of white supremacy and to justify the subjugation of black people. Race was invented to just to create and justify racism. So I think once we have a familiarity with that history, the idea that white privilege doesn't exist is just a, a nonsense because we see from the inception of the category, this is the reason these categories were invented. But what I've been quite struck by is the seeming absence of that history from a lot of conversations in this current moment, which just seems a little, it seems if there was ever a time to mainstream that history, which I think is something that we need to have a familiarity with to kind of sound a death knell to all of this. If there was ever a time where there would be mainstream interest in this, it would be this moment. And yet that, that history seems almost absent from the conversation. And I often see an almost doubling down on the sanctity of racial categories. So rather than actually, you know, dealing with their constructive fictitiousness and not to say that racism, it's not saying a oh, race is, is a, uh, you know, race was invented, so racism doesn't exist. It was invented to create racism. So moving swiftly away from, from that argument that you sometimes hear, I just wonder why there's not more focus on that history in, in this moment. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there is focus on that history, and that is why the work um, to suppress critical race theory is happening. <laughs> so variantly every, you know, in mm -hmm. books. Um, books are being re re um, removed from, from curriculum. Um, state funding is being withheld if, if certain things are being taught. Um, so this, this, this doubling down, we saw it in terms of certain European countries around um, their involvement. I'm thinking here a little bit of Poland, for example their involvement in um, anti-Semitic activities during um, Hitler's reign, you know, that the rewriting of history in order to suppress certain materials, certain involvement, certain culpabilities, certain um, complicities mm -hmm. happens constantly. And, and, and the doubling down in the United States against the teaching of the way in which racial categories were constructed and then false science coming out of places like Harvard um, were 
<laughs> created and put forward in textbooks as science, you know, in order to create a, a standard for the superiority of whiteness up against the inferiority of people of color, um, even though that's been debunked in theory, it made its way into the cultural norm in, in terms of books we read, in terms of films we've watched, in terms of all the cultural things. So that now in order to pull it apart or at least make it apparent, the work has to be as intentional as the intentional work of putting it forward in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, a concept that I wanted to um, ask you. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Sorry. So I'm just, no, no, I have no. so many more questions and I'm like, oh, we've got six minutes till I need to open it to everybody else's questions. So I'm just trying to um, just quickly, oh gosh, I really have pages. Okay. I have everything from Fred Motion to blonde hair. What do I go for? Um, I will go with the... I wanted to ask you about the, the concept that you refer to, the necropastoral, necropastoral. Am I pronounced? How do you yes, pronounce it? Yes, yes. Necropastoral. Um, I was intrigued by that. Would you describe what the necropastoral is? It's page um, 88. So, um, what page are you on? Uh, page 88. Idiot. Okay. Um, the I was really interested in that because, um, in a way, <laughs> it's 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 tied to this um, it's tied in a little bit in my mind um, to climate change. It's like how do you rethink a landscape with all of the pollution, the dead bodies, everything as part of its present situation. And so when Joelle McSweeney came up with it, I thought, oh, you know, even we think of the pastoral poetry, for example, as serene. And, <laughs> and now if you, feel, you see a field of grass, you dare not lie down in it because, you know, you don't know what kind of <laughs> um, can, cancer causing um, Oh God. <laughs> or inside. <laughs> you know, you look at it and think, oh, should I lie down? Should I have my pit in here? I don't think so. Um, so that <laughs> <laughs> so that was part of my attraction um, to it. This this way in which the landscape has to communicate all the history it has had to hold and all of the ramifications of that history on things like the weather. And, and I love that the word weather has to do with the weathering of black people that is tied to the idea of comorbidity in terms of um, COVID and how um, people have had to live lives that put them at risk, higher risk mm -hmm. in, in this time of a pandemic. So even though I wasn't thinking about the pandemic when I was writing the book, that idea of the necropastoral, it's like the world had everybody, we're now, I'm gonna use the word and, and I know I'm online, but you know, we're fucked. And, <laughs> it, 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 and it's, it's down to the roots. It's down to a degree warmer in the ocean. It's down to things like that. So that, that was, um, why I was also interested in in the um, the photograph that I write about in that section where the black woman is standing waiting for a bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was very I was very taken with that and 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 the concept and it wasn't it wasn't a term that I had um, come across before, but I'm very interested in entanglement and the connections between um, racial justice and environmental justice 
and how whiteness in how whiteness is actually related to as well as 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 well as the anti-black functions of whiteness the actually the actual environmental degradation mm -hmm. that is a consequence of whiteness you know so i was yeah and, and really one of the places we we um join in our thinking is the dislike for the word allyship and, and part of that has to do with this issue that all of these policies are detrimental to all of us. So it's not about white people coming to the aid of people of color. It's about them coming to the aid, their own aid in terms Thank of you. the <laughs> world. And, um, and, you know, the, my, my, if I could write something <laughs> that could communicate like that would be my, my, my mission to myself that would communicate that I don't, I personally don't need your help. The world needs your help. You need your help. You need your help. I, you know, we all are in this together and we are not in a good place. And I, absolutely. And that's why, oh, well, that's why I named a chapter in my book recognized that this shit is killing you too, mm -hmm. borrowing from Fred Moten, because I'm exactly. like, that's, that's exactly. what it's about. And I think that's actually one of my frustrations because I do have some frustrations with the kind of almost fetishization of interpersonal privilege that dominates in these, in these conversations. But one of the, to me, what I feel is one of the limitations of white privilege is that it kind of presupposes that the way a, a wealthy white person is living their life is the ideal we should be aspiring to as opposed to identifying that it's a, a, a lifestyle that is actually responsible for the destruction of so much you know I think it actually puts it on a pedestal when that is the very last thing that we need to be doing you know it makes it aspirational it's not aspirational the exactly. earth can't sustain it exactly and that's one of the reasons I wanted justice to live in that world. Like this is not the world that we aspire to. This is the world that is at the center mm -hmm. because it has some element of control over what decisions get made and the decisions it makes are in service of itself. So beautifully put, thank you. Um, there's a minute before I need to open it up. So I'm gonna, sneak in one more question um it is about um the i think it's the penultimate chapter um towards the end about blonde hair i was very taken with that i don't know if you can see but i have some blonde highlights in my <laughs> hair <laughs> i don't notice them <laughs> they're very I, I soft care, and i don't care that's the other thing i want to make clear i no, don't no, care. <laughs> no 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 i i care <laughs> and and I am more advanced in age than people think. And it's only at this stage in my life that I have ever colored my hair. And I did it about two weeks ago. And I was just like, of all the top, of all the timing, of course I did it. <laughs> and now I read this. But it was actually very, I've never done it before because I actually felt, certainly since I've been natural, which is well over, Okay, I have had blonde in my hair before, but many years ago when I had relaxed hair, so that's a whole different mm -hmm. situation, you know. Since I had <laughs> recovered from that, I had felt, you know, I would never put blonde in my hair again. And I felt that was something that was like, you know, a political statement. And it's just something that I just could, could not and would not do. And I, as I have slightly relaxed <laughs> over the last 10 years, I've been a bit like, sorry, because you've already sweared, because you've already opened that, that, that. <laughs> I thought, fuck it, you know, I'm going to put some blonde in my hair. But it wasn't an easy decision. And it was something that I felt like disloyal doing. I'm like, disloyal to what? what? So, so then <laughs> no one cares. So then reading this, you know, kind of two weeks after that decision, I was just like, oh, God. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I just thought it was an interesting inclusion in this book. Could you speak on it very quickly? Well, I, you know, I, um, 
The reason I say I don't care is because I think people seem to think I care. I don't. I don't care. I didn't. I didn't think you particularly cared. You were no, ruminating, no, and it was a fascinating I rumination. Mean, I didn't mean you, but I, before you went there, I thought, let me just meet. <laughs> I don't think you're there judging me because of the <laughs> highlight in my hair. And, and I think with black women, it's a very different scenario because it's rare that unless you're able to pass without the blonde hair, you know, it's rare that um, blondness in with black women allow, I could dye my hair blonde. It, it's more performance than it is a gesture of passing into something. Mm -hmm. But the question is how does whiteness perform itself inside whiteness? I mean, how does blondness perform itself inside whiteness? And what is the, tacit complicity with the idea that blondness is better in the news media, in the Republican party, in the, <laughs> in the Nazi party. Like what, how is it all a, a, an equation that adds up to something? And, you know, we have been um, socialized to believe that women just dye their hair blonde because they feel like it. Mm -hmm. By women, I mean white women here. And, and, but then you see that it, it's happening in certain places without exception. Mm -hmm. And that's when one begins to ask the question, why? What do you get from it by doing it? We all perform femininity in, in different ways. You know, I'm wearing lipstick, we're doing different things, but what does it mean to dye your hair blonde? If you're a white woman, if you're a black woman, it's a different kind of performance because it's not gonna be read in the same way. It's also interesting to me as to why a, an individual person might do it. And there are black women who, who, when we interviewed them, said things like, it lightens my face. People- Very revealing. Yeah, people like me better. Which people, why? What standard are you then performing for them? What are you giving them? What do they think they're getting from you? So those are the kinds of questions I'm, I'm interested in. I'm, I'm hoping that Just Us is a book that is about the, the process of interrogating what we take for granted. That it itself, it could be anything. It could be things outside of the book but that, the, that the, the process of the interrogation and the um, format of the book is about what, do, what does it mean to question? The things that are said to you, the things that are done in your, you know, in your space, in, comp in where you are, the things that you see, especially when it is around the construction of race. I think in this cultural and historic moment that we're in, uh, emphasizing that for people is as important and possibly more crucial than any even specific information exactly. that can be imparted, exactly. you know? Yeah, I didn't, I don't expect people to go away and memorize the information in this book, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in performing an activity. Mm -hmm. I wanted the book to perform inquiry. Absolutely. And I think particularly in this moment where there is so much reliance on, you know, kind of social media discourse, often around, particularly around race, you know, I know people that are getting really all of their information from social media. Um, and it kind of, it's, you know, it can be so reductive, it can be so inaccurate um, and didactic, like this is what you must Mm -hmm. consume and repeat and regurgitate so people are being told what to think rather than being encouraged about how to think and how to think critically and this book is such a, a I think a powerful kind of antidote to that type of um to, to, to that you know well that that was it, the intent not to um not to solve anything, but to question everything. Absolutely, and that's so, so necessary in, in, in these times. Um, okay, I have to open up to the other questions now. The first question, um, 
Okay. Um, which books and authors, oh, it's to both of us, um, but I, I, I will start with you. Do you both think of yourself in dialogue with and who should readers seek out? Wow, that's, you know, that is, that's such a large question. Well, your, I have your book right here. This lace, the last one. Oh, um, that's the, the UK edition. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but then I think I had a friend who, um, who's a, a cardiologist who uh, recently said to me, you know, she's, she's working hard in the hospital, but she said, I just gave myself the, um, project of reading through all, all of Baldwin, James Baldwin. And I think that if somebody did that, they wouldn't need to read anything. Else. Oh my <laughs> God. They could just read that. Yeah. Um, but personally, I, I tend to, I try and keep up with Fred Melton because I think he's brilliant. And um, so I think he has a new book out now with um, Harvey, which I, I'm looking forward to reading. Um, Sarah Ahmed is somebody. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the amazing um, affect theorist Lauren Ballon passed away recently. And her next book is called um, The Inconvenience of Other People. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that to come out. I'll make a note of that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's... Uh, I just read, there's so many books I read that I cannot, I can't, I just read them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read a book on the plane the other day, which I loved. Um, the author was Herrera and it was, oh God, what was it called? It was something like at the end of the world. It was a hundred pages. I literally read it. I got on the plane in New York and by the time I um, landed in LA, I had finished it. Um, wow, that's quite an endorsement. <laughs> yeah, but it would be if I could remember the title. It's, it's, something, <laughs> it's something at the end of the world um, by Herrera. And um, so, yeah, those are, what about you? Actually, uh, very similar, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Baldwin, um, you know, is somebody that I reference widely in my own work. I find, um, and, and Fred Moten as well. Um, but Baldwin in particular, I find really interesting because as you said, if you just read kind of widely across his work, you wouldn't need to read much more. I find the, how often I hear his name evoked in the current moment and yet to, and yet it, in, in, I feel like if people really engaged with his work, so many of the things that I see as, you know, kind of wrong routes to be going down or just problematic wouldn't actually be happening. You know, if people engaged with his work to the level I hear his name evoked, I actually think we'd be in quite a different place. Mm -hmm. um, so Baldwin, absolutely. Moton. Um, and who, uh, yeah, as I was, as I was reading uh, your book, I was excited by how many um, kind of similar, uh, similar people we were, we, we were referencing. So that made me feel quite in community with lots of people who I've never spoken to. So that was, um, yeah, a really, a, re a really lovely feeling. Um, Fanon as well. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I think I'll move on to the next question because we have very little time. So we called, the book is called Signs Preceding the End of the World. Signs Preceding the End of the World um, by Yuri Herrera. Signs Preceding the End of the World. Awesome. It's one for me as well. Okay, so... You touched on climate change and in the UK, we are about to begin the COP26 discussions. What does a truly inclusive climate movement look like? Can you read the first half of that again? Sure. You have touched on climate change and in the UK, we are about to begin the COP26, COP26 discussions. What does a truly inclusive climate movement look like? Oh, 
Well, I think it looks like sacrifice. It looks like, you know, real change in terms of what we believe we need. It, it has to do with emissions. It has to do with, with kinds of cars we um, drive. It has to do with plastic. <laughs> it has, you know, which in, but in a sentence, I would say it has to do with our own perception of what we need to live. I was just, um, one of the jokes in our house is um, um, that line from Hamilton, are you satisfied? <laughs> are you satisfied? And it's, the question is, what do you need to be satisfied? And, and at what point are we willing to give up things that in truth make our life easier, but are, is, is also in truth shortening what is viable in this world? So I want to, uh, yeah, I, I feel that um, things that make our life easier, but are um, actually shortening what is viable. But I actually think, yeah, it's not even so much about sacrifice, but it's about reori reorientation, and, as, yeah. as, as, as you said, because I actually don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a lot of the things that we would have to dispense of or with are things that essentially you know, are poisoning us yeah. or are making us deeply dissatisfied. I yeah. guess I'm just reiterating what you're saying. Oh, but you're right. I'd like the, the rephrasing of it because the, we think we need those things. Mm -hmm. But in fact, in, to bring up um, Lauren Ballant again, I mean, she was a great friend of mine. So she's, I, I was... One of the things that she writes about is cruel optimism. And what does it mean to be attached to things that ultimately bring about your own destruction? I mean, you could think about that in terms of white people and white supremacy. Yeah. You know, that their attachment to the, these notions of, of what whiteness gives them. And, and that's also true in terms of climate change. We, we are attached to things that ultimately are poisoning us and destroying our planet. Absolutely. Do I have, I think I have time for one more. What have your students, oh, this will have to be very quick. Do we have time? I'm just asking the group, the group if we, I'm just gonna ask it anyway. Hopefully we don't get cut off mid sentence. Um, what have your students taught you about the extent to which young people are building in solidarity through transparency rather than further division? Well, I, I you know, um, I think that this generation of students are, have held us accountable in ways that just makes me, you know, want to put on a cheerleading outfit and go out there. <laughs> because it is, it's really, sometimes I'll admit it, it feels annoying in the classroom, but ultimately it is inspiring. I hope it lasts. I hope it's not something that once they get into um, the world as people who have families, um, it goes away in terms of um, sort of capitalist um, attachments. But in right now, I feel that I come into the classroom ready to be challenged, knowing I have to be accountable to certain things. And the it's great. It's great. It's annoying. And it's great. <laughs> I absolutely love that answer. The, 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 the acknowledgement that it, it might be annoying, but it's still, it's still of great value. And actually something I really love about 
I love about your work, one of the many things is, um, you know, especially in this time where so many people, well, there's, there's a demand actually that we're these infallible beings that are absolutely right in what we say and right in our opinions. And it's like very oppositional um, and you're for or you're against is, you know, when you're talking about la la Latinx identity and you're talking about blackness like outside of America and you're acknowledging your own um, kind of lack of inform information about it and your willingness to learn from the woman that you're, you're in conversation with. And I think we just need so much more of that in this moment, admitting our own unknowing as well. And if everybody was <laughs> as gracious in doing that, you know, I think we'd be in a very... In a, in a very different place. Um, we have to wrap up there. We've gone slightly over time, but thank you so much. Um, that was you, a yeah. wonderful conversation. Emma, Claudia, thank you so much. That was really just so fascinating and stimulating and really, really touching. And I love that we've sort of ended our conversation pointing towards the next generation who remain um, a source of great hope. Um, Just Us, everybody, of course, is out now and um, the link is still in the chat. So you can um, click right through and um, pick up a copy. If you are listening on Catch Up, um, do just have a quick Google and and um, find your local bookseller to pick up a copy. Um, I think that's it for this evening, but um, a really warm virtual round of applause to you both. 